<laughs> so we will start the session already. So please help me to mute your mics for temporarily. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, on a Friday afternoon. My name is uh, Jackie. I'm the Community Manager at Nordic Innovation House Singapore. And welcome to our Nordic Health Virtual Market Entry Program closing event uh, covering the topic of healthcare beyond hospital to community. So today's agenda, uh, we have a welcome message uh, by myself uh, about Nordic Innovation House Singapore. Then we will have opening remarks by Mr. Ivan Holm, uh, Ambassador Designate at the Royal Norwegian Embassy in Singapore. Then we will have an exciting fireside chat on healthcare beyond hospital to community. Then a Nordic showcase by our 11 selected Nordic health companies that has participated in our program for the past two weeks. Then lastly, we have presentations by our Nordic Chambers in Singapore. So, Nordic Innovation House is a community platform uh, accelerating high-quality Nordic tech startups, scale-ups, and growth companies in Singapore and Southeast Asia. So, with our strong community and network, we connect Nordic companies into the right ecosystem stakeholders. So, we are supported by Nordic Innovation, and we are a unique collaboration between Nordic countries and we share the same mission of building bridges between the Nordics and the Southeast Asia. So we also have a presence in Silicon Valley, New York, Singapore, Hong Kong, and also Tokyo. So we like to provide global network and framework, which is always tailor-made to serve the local ecosystem needs. So if you'd like to find out more about us, feel free to visit our website. So without further ado, I would like to invite Mr. Ivan Holm, to give us his opening remarks. Thank you so much, uh, Jacqueline, uh, for your kind introduction. I'll just move a little bit closer here. <laughs> Dear health partners, it's very good to see you. As the newly arrived Norwegian ambassador designate to Singapore, I'm delighted to take part in this virtual dialogue hosted by the Nordic Innovation House. I'm in fact very happy to be here because Singapore is such a beautiful, exciting, and vibrant place to live and to work. So I'm looking forward to contributing towards further developing an active and growing Sino Nordic Singaporean partnership. Today, in fact, marks the second week, end of the second week quarantine period, period after I arrived from Oslo. So I'm feeling very fit and very healthy today and very happy too. So this is a good start for my introduction to the Nordic Innovation House Singapore and to over Nordic partnership. To learn about what Singapore and the Nordic countries are doing and can be doing within healthcare. I would like to pay special recognition and thanks to my colleague, Finland's ambassador for health and well-being to Dr. So, to Dr. Riese and Mr. Mekele, and the leaders of the Nordic Business Chambers. We Nordics, we have so much in common, and together we have so much to offer. Previously, I worked for the Norwegian Parliament, and while working at the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, I served on the board of both the Gavi and the Global Fund. This experience gave me a much deeper understanding about the challenges and the opportunities for improvements within the health sector. As such, I believe that positive results from the Nordic Singaporean Health Corporation may also have impact globally. Our countries are powerhouses of innovation, new technologies, and products. Among the Nordic government's key priorities are global health, attaining the sustainable development goals and innovation. They are interlinked. The health SDG has a bearing on the progress of the other SDGs and innovation is the key to progress for all the, the SDGs. The health sector, and you know it very well, is known for innovation. 
we have come to expect a steady stream of new vaccines and medicines. But modern technologies and medicine are not always affordable nor accessible for all. COVID-19 has clearly demonstrated this. I know we share the wish to leave no one behind in fighting the COVID pandemic, that all people should have access to the health services that they need. Core values in the Norwegian health policies include accessibility and affordability. That means systematic efforts to ensure the quality and the safety of treatment throughout the health and care services. A system where the patient is an active partner in managing their own health. I believe the same values go for all the Nordic countries and for Singapore. An aging population means that we may need a sizable, sizable increase in health personnel. But the solution, the solution cannot only be to employ more people. We must work in different ways with new technological and organizational solutions, including further empowering and supporting over citizens to live healthy and long lives in their own homes. E-health and new Technologies must be one of the main enablers of a patient-centered healthcare system. The E in e-health is becoming an increasingly important factor in addressing the societies and the patient requirements. In several areas, e-solution enhance the quality of care and patient safety while reducing at the same time cost. Thanks to new treatment methods, advanced di diagnostic uh, techniques, and increased focus on prevention, the average person today lives much longer than those only a few decades ago. This is very positive. COVID has accelerated digitalization and the speed of e-health care, combined with the need of greening of society, I expect this digital transformation to continue even faster than today. The Nordic countries are investing in creating a better, smarter, and more efficient healthcare system to become the most sustainable and integrated health region in the world. Singapore and the Nordic share many of the same health challenges. That's why, that's why we should also find solutions together. With that, dear partners, I thank you for your kind attention and I wish you a fruitful dialogue. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador, uh, for the opening speech. Uh, we will move on to the next segment of our program. So give me a minute to share my slides. Okay, uh, I would like to hand the mic over to Rico Makala, the Councillor for Innovation and Trade at the Embassy of Finland in Singapore. He will be the moderator for our fireside chat. Rico, please. Thank you, Jackie, so much. And thank you, Mr. Holmer, for your good uh, welcoming remarks. Uh, interesting points you made there about many aspects related to health and well-being in the Nordics and in Singapore. Uh, in addition to my role in Embassy of Finland in Singapore, I'm also part of the team at the Nordic Innovation House, together with Jackie and my Nordic colleagues here in Singapore. So now we will have a fireside chat and welcome all participants for, di for this discussion. And please post your questions to Q&A channel in the Zoom. So I will do my best to pick them up and uh, post them to our esteemed experts uh, who are here with me today. So these two people here, they have many things in common. For example, both of them studied in medical field some time ago when they started their studies. And then both of them have a wide range of experiences and actually both of them have many roles today and many hats to play in different things in national circles and international circles. So Dr. Päivi Sillanauke, 
is currently Finland's ambassador for health and well-being and she is on leave from Ministry of Social Affairs and Health in Finland, where she has held positions of Director General and Permanent Sec Secretary over the past 12 years. And Dr. Eugene Fidelisso from Singapore is currently in leadership roles, for example, at the National Healthcare Group in Singapore as the Deputy Group Chief Executive Officer for Integrated Care and he is also chief executive officer for Tantoxen Hospital, which I can actually see right now from my window, uh, from our embassy, and also of Central Health. Uh, so for those who are out, outside um, from, of Singapore, National Healthcare Group is one of the three healthcare clusters or groups taking care of Singapore's public healthcare. So now we, We'll start with a couple of premediated questions that I have thought beforehand. And as, as I said already, please post your, post your questions to Q&A for these experts from the Nordics and Singapore. So our goal is to compare similarities and find some differences in the trends and approach towards how the healthcare might be moving uh, somehow from hospitals more towards community, communities and even homes and remote care and other future directions. So let's start from Singapore because we are based here, we who are uh, running this uh, event right now, uh, Jackie and others. So Dr. So, please give your bird's eye view, a short <laughs> summary of Singapore's strategy towards moving healthcare beyond hospital to community. And we have picked these words from somewhere, <laughs> from documentation in Singapore. So how would you define the direction right now that you can see? Uh, thank you very much, Riku. It's a great pleasure to be here and to meet all the wonderful colleagues and friends from the Nordic countries, as well as here in Southeast Asia. Uh, your Excellencies, um, thank you very much for the big support for, for innovation and healthcare. Well, um, Riku, really very, uh, very much in brief, um, the hospital to community is really a metaphor here uh, for the transformation of our healthcare delivery system. Right? We want to move from a disease-based uh, healthcare delivery system to something that's more upstream and needs-based. We want to move away from the idea of just being a repair shop. And we really want to look at activation and preventive health. Um, we want to move away from the idea that healthcare is about volume to where is really what, what really matters for our patients, which is the value that they see in the care that they receive, and to move away from a very episodic mindset in healthcare to one that is more relationship-based. Uh, ultimately, a lot of healthcare in Singapore today are very much center-based sort of services that are organized around facilities. I think we want to go to a more place-based model where we can really build relationships in the communities and with the patients so that care is more accessible and care can easily be uh, more upstream uh, where there is stronger ownership of health. And so that really represents the entire metaphor of that change in the health system that we want to see and that comes actually from the Ministry of Health, uh, where they do want to see a big pivot from hospitals to community-based care models. Okay, thank you. Nice overview. So not the repair shop anymore, except when repairs are needed. Yes. So Dr. Silanauke, how would you summarize the future directions in healthcare system in Finland and in the Nordics when we think about where and how to receive support and care and when to think about repair shops and when to think about patient-centric uh, efforts and other aspects. Thank you, Rico. Uh, great to be here with, uh, with you and hear also the uh, quite similar strategies uh, uh, that we just heard uh, from from uh, Singapore and their strategy. Uh, actually, there have been for decades uh, in many countries uh, strategies that they would like to have had more integrated care. But actually, I think that now 
uh, we, we uh, have the technology which could then really help us with that. And we have seen during the COVID situation that, that uh, digitization and remote services have been helping us a lot with people to get the information uh, and also then uh, healthcare providers then to, to um, sir, uh, give their services to people uh, uh, as remote services. In Finland and in Nordic countries, we have already reached a certain basic level of maturity in digital health and electronic uh, management of health data. And we have had uh, uh, for long 100% uh, patient records and, and also way how the data then from present records follow the patient from uh, dif uh, between different organizations. And currently we are no, now focusing on getting also the uh, people's well-being data into those registers so that, uh, uh, that when we now have uh, uh, had uh, should I say the most advanced legislation in the world, the secondary use of the data, health data, that also the well-being data could be then used uh, for, for better um, uh, health and well-being. And actually, as we just heard from uh, Dr. Eugene, that, that also prevention is a really important part, and there we need uh, the, the well-being data. And lastly, I would say that, that uh, 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 I, I um, uh, also uh, uh, have a same kind of, and we also have the same kind of, of strategy of have a seamless patient pathways than Singapore. So I see a great opportunity, some a potential for collaborating together, both uh, at the government level, but also at the, uh, as a healthcare providers level, but also the, the startups and, and uh, technological comp companies to create and, and collaborate together to better health and for our digitalized um, healthcare. Thank you, Rico. Okay, seamless patient pathways was one thing I picked up from, from your good summary, because there are so many aspects that we could discuss about. So, hey, uh, let's... Um, Let's now think about concrete actions and concrete examples. Uh, healthcare services usually change rather slowly because things have to be evidence-based and then new technologies come and go, but the change, making change happen is rather slow process. Uh, but we have seen a lot of change in the last few years, both in the Nordics and in Singapore. What would be your examples of things that have already uh, worked and could be illustrative examples of the potential future uh, of services and approaches uh, in larger scale. So what would be those examples? Let's start from Eugene, please. What would you share? Well, Riku, I'm really very envious of what the Nordic countries have done around your registries and your data. Um, I, I, you know, really that is a huge change. And there's something that we want to get better organized here. Um, we do have uh, data that resides at all levels of our care provision system and, and out there in the community with our social care partners. And we need to bring that together to have a complete view of, of every resident and population. Uh, this will allow us to better integrate uh, health and social care and allow us to go upstream to be able to uh, work with our residents um, in the care that matters to them. Um, I would say that in Singapore, um, our when we were a younger country, we're still young, <laughs> but when we were younger, uh, the focus was really very much on getting access, uh, beefing up the quality of healthcare services and ensuring affordability in care. That used to be our traditional triple aim of healthcare. And we're now trying to move towards more of a population-based mental model uh, around the triple aim. And that really looks at population outcomes, cost per capita, as well as care experiences. And we need to be able to join that up. And 
you know, to have a title like integrated care is a very tall order because that almost is the holy grail of healthcare, isn't it? Everyone wants integrated and seamless care. And so there are many initiatives on the ground in which we try to attempt um, to join that up, right? Uh, one initiative uh, is a work in progress still, but very much uh, on the way there um, is uh, not just to look at a hospital to home, but a home to hospital to home sort of care transition program enabled by uh, technology. And what we learn is that um, um, it is necessary for us to create the ecosystem where we can stack up the technologies such that that, that journey and the integration um, has a full roadmap in terms of a patient journey. And that allows us very much um, to achieve many of the care transition goals that we would like to see. Um, we also feel that it's probably important for us to embed uh, um, health services and change the model of healthcare delivery within the communities where we have been actively looking at embedding uh, community health teams. These are teams of nurses, allied health, and we want them to work in new ways uh, his Excellency mentioned the idea of manpower and clearly Singapore, uh, we don't have enough babies um, and we are really short of manpower and, and we, we cannot rely on the foreign manpower um, really to fulfill all our needs. So we're going to have to change the way we can. So even when we go out and build a community workforce, we are trying to reimagine what that workforce is because taking the hospital model and putting it out there in the community is not going to work. Um, the hospital has a many-to-one mental model. Uh, out there in the community, you probably need a one-to-many mental model. So we're trying to experiment with things like transdisciplinary care, and we're trying to look at new workforce models that uh, have shared skills between providers and professionals, and we're trying to use digital to enable that connection back to the ecosystem. Um, so those are some evolving examples. I'm sure we are not there yet, um, but we hope to work with many partners that can make that possible. Thank you. Paivi, what would you say about examples of things already happening? Uh, thank you, Rick. And I was so pleased to hear what uh, Eugene just mentioned about the social care also, how important it is also to, to uh, add to the health system. And, and uh, we uh, are in, uh, in Finland um, for, uh, for some years now uh, trying to more and more integrate the social and health services, not only the, uh, the social and primary health care, but also to the specialized care. So Eugene said that we can't just have the uh, hospitals and, and uh, from hospital to home, but also from home to hospital and understand better how the people that then can, can manage uh, a good life uh, at, at homes and, uh, uh, and, and have also support from specialists then. Uh, and and uh, we are now digitize, uh, digitize, uh, digitizing our social services so that we really get the whole social and health service, service system in, in the registers we can use. And, um, and uh, that was very important also uh, that, that um, professionals use and have easy access to digital uh, tools that they can then share their information uh, for the best of the patient. And uh, for that, we have uh, established a so-called CATI uh, project here. Government is uh, financing that uh, project and it's in, in, in quite many regions uh, already in Finland, uh, running for two years now. And it actually gives ecosystem where academy, uh, private sector, and public sector uh, social and health services. So called, uh, they, they can uh, together uh, develop then uh, tools for this use so that the professionals are there, patients are there, and then also private sector and, and uh, researchers uh, and scientists so that they can together 
uh, uh, then develop uh, the tools. And that would be a good ecosystem then also from if there are uh, Singaporean co companies who would like to come then to these, these projects and ecosystems, we can then, then develop the tools uh, together because we already have the, uh, the regulation for using the data. And then you can have showcases for Singaporean who would then be perhaps more willing to give also their information and for politi politicians, their, uh, their possibility to have legislation also for, for that. And I would like to also mention uh, our, our um, unique AI system. We are also building a uh, national AI environment to be able to use uh, uh, wisely there uh, and, uh, and broadly than the uh, different uh, registers we have in a very secure way so that people can trust that that their information is is there uh, safe but what that would then then give them is that that uh, there would be then smooth ways then to really prevent for example young people to to exclude from the society because they could get uh, help uh, via chat uh, and and uh, and then sharing the data so that uh, that uh, people uh, that the professionals can help them and give uh, them information about possi possible services but also educational possibilities or unemployed people, or also uh, older people living at, at home uh, at the risk of social exclusion or marginalization. So, uh, or, uh, or wanting and old people needing help so that they can stay longer uh, there. So this AI environment, we call it Aurora AI, and then also this project where we, we have formed ecosystems to develop the tools. Back to you, Rico. Okay, thank you. Actually, we have several really good questions already uh, in from the audience members. So let's jump to kind of one thing that you kind of have touched, but haven't mentioned, regulation and healthcare IT systems, digital health. Question is that, what are your thoughts about regulation of digital health? Do we need to do it and how to, and how should we go with it? Short answers, please, so we don't want to dig too deep into this potential <laughs> swamp. So let's start from Baby this time. Thank you. Yes, my answer shortly is yes, we need regulation uh, and legislation for that. There is no other way we can keep uh, the trust we need from the population. So it would be for them, uh, it, it, it's, it's very important that people feel that their uh, uh, sensitive data is in safe and uh, and no one who is not allowed to can have access to to the information which is linked to their identification and therefore uh, we have uh, is that uh, we have um, uh, this act for secondary use of the data that we have uh, uh, then um, uh, founded a uh, um, uh, uh, public organization, so-called Fin Data, which has then, um, according to uh, our, our legislation, uh, right to pick the data from different registers, anonymize that uh, data, and then uh, uh, give licenses to those who will use the data, and then also give a secure environment to, uh, to uh, then, then handle the data. And therefore, uh, for example, uh, when when we launched the the COVID app, uh, uh, people uh, really showed that our legislation or regulation have worked because forty percent of our population has uh, uh, downloaded uh, uh, loaded the app and uses, and that is a world record. Okay, yes, thank you. So it sounds like at least in Finland we have needed legislation and we have needed to make some big changes to make some things possible. Eugene, well, what's your... Yeah, I, I would agree very much that we do need regulations and I do think that the primary purpose of that is really building trust in the system. Um, I would add just one more point to say that I think that we will our, our residents and the citizens would want to trust that the system will do them good. And, and therefore, to some degree, the meaningful use of that data will be just as important. 
um, uh, in terms of ensuring that that is accessible when you need it for your care and, and also for, for developments that would enable better healthcare uh, for, for, for our residents, yeah. Could I recall, add to that, that that is really important that we, we uh, when we use data, uh, the trust is built uh, by other, of course, the legislation and people can trust that the data is used well. But then if the services then uh, uh, help there in their everyday life, that builds the trust and willingness then also to, to uh, have more that kind of services or even they would uh, uh, ask that as they have done in Finland because they have been used to have so, uh, digital services in other fields. So they are asking also healthcare to provide them digital services. Okay, thank you. Uh, in about 10 minutes, we are going to get in our commentator who will join the discussion from that point, of point forward. So let's continue on digital health side and audience questions. So. There are multiple platforms and apps and cloud services for different needs in digital health. For example, today, later in this session, there will be lots, several Nordic health IT solutions showcased quickly there. So how do you see the selection and integration of these technologies and platforms? Because there are so many already and more are coming available. So. Eugene, I know that you have been traveling the world and visiting some interesting places who are using some of these, and you are using many of those already at Tantoxen Hospital and in Singapore. So what would you say about this? I haven't been traveling for two years now. So Sorry, yeah, you used <laughs> to travel. Behind. But uh, I, I realize Peter has just joined us as well and I very much like to hear his views. So, but I, I would say that uh, there are two things that I think are important um, to, to work with um, various tech companies and startups in the digital space is that as, as, as on the other side of the house, as the user side, you know, we would like to see the ability to stack up applications. Um, you know, just having desperate applications all over the place doesn't quite join up care or integrate care for us. Uh, we would like to see um, the, the industry come together to look at solutioning that will make it, um, may make it feasible for us to stack up the solutions around the patient. Uh, the second part is really having a clear roadmap in terms of development. Um, we will need to be able to understand where we are headed with this. Uh, because that, 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 that visibility will allow us to plan and to be able to resource uh, such systems much better, um, to, such that it's not just buying on the wing, right? Um, and, and the third part is that I think we like to see that lined up nicely with business models in healthcare. I think a lot of the time when we introduce technologies, they do not work, not because the technology is bad, but because, you know, how do you pay for it? How do you how do you transact? And uh, some, those are some of the some of those challenges. Um, so we will need, as we move to population health, as we move to uh, digital health, to also make sure that the financial and, and the way we 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 um, support healthcare resourcing will, will need to align, to line up nicely as well. Okay, then over to Pei. Thank you. Uh, easy to continue what Jean just said because uh, they are really, really uh, important uh, uh, dimensions of, of uh, uh, to be able to have really a people-centered digitized uh, uh, world and, and healthcare. Um, I would also uh, point out uh, the, um, the challenges we have in diversity uh, and, and uh, the, uh, that there are so many different sol uh, solutions and tools, um, uh, devices at homes. Already people have them here, a lot of them, I think that also in Singapore. Uh, and and uh, how can then people manage that? If we think about uh, old people, we think about uh, um, then, uh, uh, mental health people, for example, uh, depression, how, how are they uh, really, uh, how it would be then easy to use 
the, the, these uh, together, then that they play well together. That is one challenge we have. And then the other one is uh, a little bit different. It's about the healthcare and social care providers and all other providers. How do they work together so that we can really get a seamless uh, 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 people pathways then for for a better care and well-being? Okay, so we have touched already several challenges and several opportunities in this discussion, but let's now take in our commentator and uh, third person to the discussion. So Dr. Peter Rizzo is a co-founder and chief operating officer of a Norwegian digital health company, Divia, which was founded eight years ago. He has also worked as a physician for over 15 years in Norway. And because he is both user of technologies and also uh, he has been in the user side of these technologies in a healthcare settings. So Peter, what would you add to the discussion that has happened this far? Are we missing something or would you like to underline some of the points made this far? And by the way, welcome for the discussion. Please put your mic on. Yep. My apologies. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. It's uh, been very interesting to listen to the discussion and uh, be here. Um, I think um, my experience is 10 years running a digital startup towards the hospital sector, which is a complex enterprise environment. If in terms of IT, it's completely different from a consumer environment where you sell to like directly to the patients. And uh, we've been, you know, we're a company that's mostly about two things that we're really good at. And one of them is user experiences, good user experiences. And, you design those for the users. And the other thing we're good at is complex enterprise IT and getting integrations to work. Because we believe that unless you get, I, I worked as a doctor for 10 years and unless you get systems that talk together, it's a nightmare to use as a healthcare person, personnel, right? I think this is a very universal experience across every country. So I think uh, it was interesting to think to listen to the talk about integrations. I believe that there is one huge development that's, that's happened over the last 10 years. And I think when we met hospitals 10 years ago, they, they were completely unaware and didn't reflect about standards or terminologies in any way. That's matured a lot in 10 years, at least in the Nordic markets, where they started asking for standards, they started asking for, uh, thinking about how will this system could fit with all the other systems. That's a huge change over the last 10 years that this has become a lot more important. And I would say it's still, it's still, it still has a lot of way to go because it is a complex environment. You have to kind of not only standardize the envelope that you're sending things from A to B, from system A to B, but you also generally have to standardize the words that you're putting into the envelope as well. But there is a lot of progress in that area that makes me optimistic that it can have seamless interoperable healthcare. Uh, I think Ogene was into something that's very interesting about business models. Uh, because the business models, at least that we've seen traditionally used at hospitals, is the business model of the 70s, right? You buy, you buy the software, you install the software in one version, and then you wait a couple of years, and then you buy the new version of the software. And otherwise, you just kind of maintain it. Basically, you buy Word, Word 2013, and then you buy Word 2016 when that arrives. But if you notice, a lot of software has moved into Office 365, right? It's a subscription, you continuously update it. And that mentality of continuously updating, getting an update every two weeks, uh, I think that's coming to, at least where I'm, the hospital we're working to, we're striving hard to kind of get that mentality that you have an app on your phone as a clinician and it updates every two weeks if you get better. That's fairly unusual, but that's, I think that's where we're heading, but it also requires completely different business models. And then you suddenly look at business models like software as a service, which you look, which are common outside of healthcare, and you're trying to suddenly fit that into a very complex IT environment uh, that's very modeled after traditional corporate enterprise generally. 
Yes. Hey, if I may jump in here, because I saw Eugene nodding there. He's been in charge of lots of buying of software for hospital setting and so on. So there's actually a really good kind of related question from the audience. So uh, traditionally, health IT systems have been provided by big companies, Microsoft and GE Healthcare of the world and Epics of the world and so on. Uh, what about startups and smaller providers? Uh, how can they sell solutions for bigger healthcare providers such as National Healthcare Group in Singapore or in Finland for uh, public healthcare sector? Uh, so let's ask first from the so-called buyer side and then come back to Peter who can tell how it really has worked, <laughs> worked in the Nordics. So baby, what would you say? Can small companies, startups, innovative smaller companies provide their solutions that could be really taken into use in the Finnish environment or in the Nordics? Yes, absolutely. There are many of them and they are very flexible and they can give them, uh, them um, help to a certain focused uh, problem. And uh, therefore, it is really important that we have a modular system. We have a system where the interfaces are so uh, harmonized and standardized that, that the data can flow then. Uh, and, and they uh, the, the, uh, uh, the uh, different uh, programs and different uh, 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 tools are then integrated together. And uh, we have actually in Finland approached this uh, so that we have a national um, patient archive where you can put also that well-being data and we didn't uh, want to have a one patient record for whole country so we there are several and that will then give also possibility for smaller uh, 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 companies and startups to put and have their uh, their innovations and tools then in that uh, that uh, environment when the interfaces are standardized and of course, then there are many uh, Finland uh, 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 small companies who are really uh, good at managing the data. Uh, and and uh, there also uh, we have seen a great success for small companies uh, then and startups to grow uh, for being able to, uh, 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 to, to find out uh, really uh, easy ways to handle the data. And a secure, uh, uh, you know, secure way also using AI and, and digital tools. So absolutely, there is room for startups also. So Eugene, what would you say for that? Yeah, I, I would say that I would really welcome a, a more uh, active marketplace uh, with a combination of uh, small companies as well as larger ones who who can behave like small companies as well. Um, that would be great uh, to have that ecosystem. I would say that the big companies do bring scale. They do bring um, some level of risk management in terms of for big providers like ourselves. Um, but at the same time, the small companies um, actually give more space for co-development. Uh, they are definitely more responsive and agile in terms of the solutioning. And certainly, you know, on the buyer side of the house, we can be a bit smarter, right? Um, we, we need to change the way we procure. And, and that is why in, in certain ways, um, we, we need to create the, the, the access um, uh, to such um, solutioning uh, uh, in the startup industry. Um, that is what we have been trying to do at the Center for Healthcare Innovation. Uh, we could be tr we're trying to create a way of that near marketplace solutions can come into healthcare. So we just recently concluded uh, our first round um, to test bait these solutions in because traditionally in the typical government procurement sort of mental models, you know, this will be very difficult to access, uh, especially for large providers. So we do need to be smarter buyers and we do need the mechanisms to be in place to facilitate that. Okay, thank you. Peter, you have been selling for healthcare providers for many years. So is it possible or are you always losing for big players? So well, what... it's, uh, it's, 
It depends on what, uh, what, what kind of organization it is. It's completely different if you're talking to a GP's office that has independent autonomy, or if you're talking to a large healthcare system, which generally very structured. And I can say that, uh, and you said you have to, our experience is yes, you had to beat all the big ones because there are public procurement rules and particularly for hospitals in the all of the European Union, it goes out on a public tender. It basically means as a startup, you have to be able to write a better public tender than let's say the Norwegian version of Epic. And we, that is actually possible. We've done that more than once. Um, I think one other thing that's underappreciated generally is the need for good uh, access to test environments with synthetic data. So that if you do entrepreneurship and do startups, you generally learn, get out, get out there as early as quickly, validate your idea, iterate over it. But that's very hard unless you have access to test environments where you can do that safely. Because otherwise you have to kind of get your day, you have to kind of construct it, you have to approve it, and then you can kind of figure out whether it works. And if that's a two year process to just figure out if the concept works, that's very, that's hampering innovation a lot. So we realized over the time that the synthetic type good test facilities would be good. The last thing is, there are ways to make this easier. And uh, we've been, uh, this is actually a project I enjoy very much because I was there 10 years ago when it was started. I had nothing to do with it. I just noticed that it was started in Boston 10 years ago, uh, which called Smart on Fire, which is basically a framework for providing plug-in apps in other electronic patient hospital records. And this has grown over 10 years. We're working to set up a platform in Norway for the specialty healthcare services. And this is part of our product offering, actually. And it's because basically as a startup, you realize how hard it was to actually get something into production from kind of a startup and getting it approved. It's all the regulations actually getting in the hands of clinicians at hospital. That's years of work. What we realized is that you can take a lot of the heavy work that isn't very interesting for innovators, authentication, authorization, logging, integration, all these things that kind of belong in enterprise IT, and then you can handle them as a service, and then you can provide a platform to developers that's basically, here is a very nice standardized API for integration, and we handle all the heavy stuff, and then you just load your app in the app store, and it's easy to kind of distribute it in a way that there hasn't been before. And that, I think that's a very nice about getting these platforms up and running. And it's basically something every EHR provider could provide. This is the same technology that uh, Epic uses for Epic Orchard uh, and Cerner uses for Cerner Code. So basically setting up these kinds of platforms will make it a lot easier for startups to access, to kind of shorten the time from having a good idea to getting in the hands of clinicians. Okay, hey, let's follow on that platform. So what type of platforms do we have in Singapore and in Finland that can help these innovative companies somehow to plug in? So Eugene, could you please describe a little bit more about what you have been developing here in Singapore to enable that? Yeah, so so there are quite a number of accelerators and incubators in Singapore and we a lot of times uh, work very closely with um, many of our startups here. Um, having said that, the, you know, when it comes to when the dust hits the road and you need to get into the marketplace, uh, you have a huge, you know, um, a huge jump ahead of you. And that was why um, we had decided to, to start, start a, 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 well, a kind of a new way to think about how we will procure and uh, so the three big hospitals in Singapore came together to really uh, organize a, a startup enterprise sort of link that we could invite um, uh, startups from all over the world. I mean, it's not just Singapore startups uh, to offer us solutions along certain lines. And we will pay for the test baiting in our system and we will green lane it right after that uh, for procurement purposes. So we are trying it out. We're going to do a second run. Uh, very soon and hopefully we can attract more uh, funding and as well as uh, more healthcare institutions to join us in some of this yeah so there's one example yeah thank you yeah that's a highly interesting example and i must tell that many nordic companies also participated in that 
global challenge. So thank you for organizing it and we'll be there again next time. Maybe what examples would you share from Finland or other Nordics? Yeah, we have uh, in Finland uh, uh, enhancing the building of ecosystems and then companies to collaborate both at the, uh, the municipality level but also at the, the national level uh, so that, that we are financing from Ministry of, of Social Affairs and Health but also the Business Finland then uh, financing uh, municipalities and then companies. And uh, I already mentioned earlier the CATI project, which is a project that uh, aims to give uh, then, uh, then um, uh, environment or is giving environment in, in some districts then to develop uh, smart solutions for, for uh, better and longer living at, at homes for elderly people. Then we have in our uh, biggest university hospital, HUS, uh, Helsinki University Hospital, so-called Clever Health Network, where they offer uh, then companies a collaboration uh, um, platform uh, where uh, both the hospital and then the, the companies and researchers can together uh, then uh, uh, agree on how to use and handle the data they are not handle but but use the data they have at, that is already uh, all the time um, uh, coming. Uh, so they are having kind of data lake and then when, because we have this uh, secondary use of the data action, there are possibilities also to have this kind of, for this kind of purposes, then, then a data. And then big cities have also, uh, it, uh, they, they um, uh, finance uh, environments where you can then, then uh, do collaboration with, uh, with uh, 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 academy, uh, the scientists, and then also uh, the professionals and public sector and then private sector. So there are uh, ways we, we would like to facilitate this collaboration. And uh, one for AI and robotics is, uh, is also have been, that has been running uh, for some years now uh, where we are aiming to have solutions and collaboration with private with private sector companies mm, yeah, but also NG some NGAs are there uh, to, to uh, aim to have a smart home concepts. Okay, thank you. So we are closing towards the end. We have a lot of really good questions but let's ask kind of high level question that always comes up. Who pays? So digital health and all these tools, somebody has to pay. So who pays for these in Singapore and in the Nordics? So let's ask from Eugene first. Everyone pays, right? <laughs> so at the end of the day, you know, um, I think whether it's a tax-based system or whether it is a fee-for-service system, someone has to pay for healthcare. Um, but the 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 way we want to look at it is that we it is more the alignment of the incentives that's important in structuring a financing system. Uh, so there's no perfect financing system and models. They're all the trade-offs, but it is how we seek the alignment between the payer, the provider, and the patient ultimately that really puts everyone on the same page. And if that incentive is towards outcomes and towards sustainability in care, I think then we have a sweet spot there, yeah. Okay, alignment is a key word there. Bye. Yeah, I, I agree that everyone pays and because we have in Nordic countries taxation based welfare system, so uh, everyone pays taxes and then there is also incentive for government side to offer effective and good services. So there is a win win situation for the taxpayer and the government then to really try to establish an effective uh, system that works well. And, and uh, therefore, uh, Nordic countries have invested uh, from public money, from tax money, then the infrastructure really for the, for the digital system. That, that, is, that is so important that we have uh, infrastructure where everyone has access really to these, these tools. And of course, then for well-being uses, um, uh, for, uh, people buy a lot to themselves also. So, uh, and, and we make then from the public say, uh, side, possible to also add that data then to, to uh, if they people then will then to the development of, of new tools for their health and well-being. Peter, how would you define 
who pays? I think, uh, at least in the European Union or the Nordic countries, it's generally, it, the bill will end up with the government because it's a public healthcare system for most of these needs. But one thing that we noticed that's a transition is what budget is being, like what budget is being used. But because some of the problems is that maybe you're saving the, mon the hospital money but you're increasing kind of the cost for the primary healthcare services. Generally, that often is the other way around, that basically the hospital does more, it costs a little bit more for the hospital, but it has huge savings in the private care uh, system. So that's generally a challenge, at least with the financing model you have in Norway, and I think many other countries. The other thing we noticed that is there is a shift kind of for moving this from thinking about this as like a CapEx budget or an investment budget and more of a running operational budget. This is particularly true if you're transitioning to software as a service. Uh, and basically stop thinking of, we've been used to kind of having these silos with budgets and then you have the ICT department's budget and that's supposed to be as low as possible. And then you have the kind of clinician's budget that's supposed to be as low as possible and so on. But generally, you then miss the effect of if you increase productivity or clinicians, then basically you should be able to kind of pay a little bit more. There is, it makes sense to pay more for IT if you're doing the core function more effectively, that you increase the productivity of clinicians. And that's generally, but it, there are some bureaucratic hustles in movie this from one budget to another and thinking of this as a whole rather than separate parts. So there is money, more money is needed and these, for example, electronic health record systems, they are huge investments. In Finland, we have several ones right now under implementation, huge projects, and then there are smaller things to implement. But hey, we are coming to the end. So before we close, let's all smile and Jackie will take a photo of us now when we are all here. Yes, I'm here. Ready? One, two, three. Okay, excellent. Okay, that was the photo shoot. We'll share that with all of you. And then I will share in the chat channel a couple of articles by Eugene's team at Tantoxen Hospital about how they have developed some things in, in hospital, uh, a hospital without walls and other, other things that they have uh, been working on. So I will share them there, but please don't focus on them now because next you will hear about some highly interesting innovative Nordic technology innovations that are available in Singapore and Southeast Asia right now. So thank you so much, experts there, all doctors. So we'll finish it here. Yes. Thank, thank, you. Over to you. Yep. thank you so much, Riku. There is definitely a very exciting fireside chat. I hope you guys has uh, uh, had some, you know, received some great insights about that. And let me do some tweaking hold on sorry about that okay so now next to the next segment of our program uh we have it's already 5 p.m so okay we have the nordic showcase by our 11 selected health companies so they have went through two weeks with us and it's been quite a journey and now we would like to present them uh, with their solutions and how and what they're looking for in this new market and how they're impacting uh, lives and also the healthcare ecosystem. So uh, without further ado, can I have uh, Algodex? Sure. So, hello everyone, I'm Alvin Tate. At Algodex, we aim to improve patients' outcomes across various clinical settings and reduce healthcare costs with our pipeline of algorithms. Next slide. Today, I would like to introduce Novoi Sepsis, the first CMAP sepsis prediction algorithm. Sepsis, it accounts for more than 35% of hospital deaths and a 5% of total hospital costs. However, sepsis diagnosis is a challenge. Faced with this unmet clinical need, we develop Novoi Sepsis a clinical decision support tool that accurately predicts sepsis onset in adult ICU patients up to three hours in advance using only common clinical data points. Guiding you to the top right of the screen to eliminate extra lab tests and manual tabulations 
The voice sepsis will integrate with existing EHR systems to collect the data points for prediction. Hence, we aim to greatly reduce time until first clinical intervention, the length of stay, and costs incurred, bring efficiency of care to ICUs. Next, to the bottom right of the screen, not only is Novoi sepsis CE mark, but also currently being validated in the largest randomized clinical trial ever conducted on its kind. We are also leading a multi-centered study with GE Healthcare. More importantly, with an accuracy of 86%, Novoi sepsis outperforms existing early warning systems and our competitors. So, if what I shared interests you, I'll be happy to share more and explore opportunities with you. Hence, with disease prediction algorithms, let's save lives and reduce healthcare costs together. Thank you. Thank you, Alvin from Algodex. Next, we have Optomat. Thank you. Hello, I'm Petri Hultner from Optomat. Optomat offers leading fundus cameras and software solutions with integrated artificial intelligence to be used in screening for cancer and blinding eye diseases. Next, please. On the top right, you can see a wide variety of different fundus cameras, both handheld portable devices and desktop devices. On bottom right, you can see a selection of, of our IT solutions, which scale all the way from, from private clinic to, to a sc um, screening workflow management programs called Avenue Screen. Screening is a key element in preventive healthcare. And with our Avenue Screen uh, programs and IT, uh, IT workflow management systems, we can help to set up a safe and effective screening program for different cancers or eye disease. With properly set up program, one can come up with better clinical results, improve accessibility for screening, and create cost efficiency. Optimate is happy to partner with different stakeholders in Singapore with piloting our system or setting up partnerships to set up a screening progress. Thank you. Thank you, Petri from Optomat. Next, we have Mika from Pro Wellness. Hi, everyone. Can you show my slides, please? Hi, uh, my, my name is Mika Sibila from Pro Wellness Health Solutions. We specialize in software solutions for the prevention and management of chronic conditions, including diabetes, chronic respiratory conditions, cardiovascular and heart diseases. Next, please. One of the challenges in diabetes and in chronic care is that over 99% of the time, patients manage their condition outside clinic facilities, at work, at home, at hobbies. So this means that pre-scheduled appointments don't really help when patients actually need help. And this is where Balancia comes into play. Balancia is a smart, mobile, digitalized self-management system that supports care automation 24 seven. Intelligent automated assistance in the product provide patients with personalized guidance on their smartphones independent of time and place. So how does this work? Clinics define personalized care plans for patients, set personal goals and switch on automated 24 seven assistance in the care plans. The care plans get automatically sent to patient cell phones and start guiding and monitoring the patients 24 seven. Patients need to do their home tests and capture other information as instructed by clinics and according to their care plans. And Balancer will analyze the data and provide patients with real-time observations, real-time guidance and advice. Smart analytics in the system automatically detects and points out issues with the patients to clinics and helps clinics prioritize on those patients who need attention, which results in effective population management. So Balancer is about 24 seven care automation, not just remote monitoring. Studies about Balancia in diabetes care show that Balancia significantly decreases the level of HbA1c while at the same time reducing risk of hypoglycemia. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Medify. Hello, 
Mental health disorders are unfair for patients, professionals, and care providers. COVID-19 has highlighted the importance of effective and digital mental health care. I'm Walter Korpiarski, the CEO and co-founder of Medified. Next slide. In the future, mental health care will be provided with the modern and cost-efficient hybrid care models. Data-driven digital, digital solutions will enable and optimize both online and offline care paths. Medified offers cloud-based software that enables data-driven treatments by creating a secure channel between professionals and patients. We combine multiple data sources to create more extent and a unique overview of the patient personal recovery journey. The patient-centric mobile platform can be seen part of the treatment and to be used between the appointments. The mobile solution intensifies and activates the care with the personalized and psychoeducational data analytics. For professionals, we provide unique clinical insights. Cloud-based dashboard increased the impact and productivity of the professionals by supporting the clinical decision-making and patient flow. Our successful projects with the Nordic partners have validated the clinical need and proof of value. We have collaboration with one of the biggest European mental health NGO, as well as multiple Nordic hospital districts. Now we are exploring international collaboration opportunities. The need for personalized care hasn't changed even though healthcare services are offered remotely. Our solution will support the digital transformation while maintaining the quality of care. We are the future of mental health. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Health Fox. Good morning and good afternoon to all our guests of honor and other attendees. Thank you for this opportunity. My name is Krishna Rivuse and I'm in charge of the international business development and research of Health Fox. And I will presenting how Health Fox can help make healthcare easier tomorrow. Next slide, please, Jackie. We have identified two major issues in healthcare, fragmentation of care and how to build the relationships for an accountable patient. HealthFox patented service concept connects citizens and patients to healthcare providers, and our dynamic IoT platform collects vital information of the patient from national health and social care hospital systems and other databases into one single snapshot. With the integration, we connect doctors and care chains to share the same information of the patient and make better treatment decisions. In mental health, for example, we have evidence that therapists can treat up to 14 times more patients with Health Fox digital care pathways than in that of traditional face-to-face -face therapy. Our solution provides modules from preventative care right through to the delivery of fact-based information for diagnosis. We provide self-care from the first doctor's appointment and continued follow-up. Our service promise is to decrease the risk for depression and also the risk for recurrent injury, as well as the accumulation of sick leave and amount of disability pension. Health Fox offer one single solution for outpatient care to improve doctor time efficiency, quality of care and quality of life by saving the healthcare resources and costs. We make use of design thinking workshops to, like, to localize our Health Fox easier tomorrow to fit your care and medical processes. We are looking for new business opportunities, distributors, collaborative partners, and investors to take Singapore outpatient care to the next level. Health Fox, creating an easier tomorrow. Thank you. Next, we have Lin Chat. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Laura Virros, and I'm responsible for sales and our customer implementations here at Lin Chat. Uh, NinChat is a smart telehealth solution that combines chat, video, bots, and alerts. And can you pass the next slide, please? Yes. So in last year, there were about 1 million appointments in healthcare uh, through our system. And of course, several millions of chats in the nonprofit side. So NinChat is also used by these nonprofit organizations, for example, in mental health. Uh, the Finnish participants recognize probably Sekas in chat, uh, which has 1,600 people uh, from nonprofit organizations uh, supporting chats with young people. In the left hand corner, you can see a children's symptom navigator uh, that leads actually to a nurse in person chat. 
So the symptom navigator finds out the information about the child and then the nurse can give further instructions for the parent. And on the right hand side, you see private uh, countrywide healthcare service company Terveustalo, who is using NinChat for all their uh, patient consultations, both doctors and nurses. Uh, NinChat collects uh, all the data uh, from these uh, visits and uh, can then provide those uh, combined so that the services can develop, be developed further. NinChat is also used in maternity clinics, uh, uh, both anonymous and authenticated throughout Finland, uh, both, uh, both in public and private side. If you're interested in speeding up your telehealth part, uh, we are very happy to discuss further partnerships or you trying out in pilots. Thank you. Thank you, Ninchat. Uh, next, we have Orchestro. Hello, everybody. My name is Janne Parkkila. I'm the CEO of Orchestrio. And what we do is uh, we orchestrate entire outpatient clinics to treat patients more efficiently with the existing resources. Next slide, please. So basically what we're doing is we are using data to understand what is happening inside an ho a hospital or an outpatient clinic, how to improve the processes there and how to make, how to make things more efficient. So this means having more patient appointments with the existing human resources, shortening the patient queues and understanding the overall structure, how things are working, how to put the right people with the right equipment to the right rooms with the right patients at the right time. So basically what we have been able to achieve uh, in the history, we've been serving tens of thousands of patients. So the queues have been disassembled faster with just using lean methods, lean processes instead of hiring new people. And we've been able to for example, improve the patient flow by over 30% in, in our clinics. So basically what we do is an ERP system that uses to analyze what is happening inside your hospital and how to make it more efficient. Thanks, that was my couple of seconds. Thank you so much, Yanni. Next, we have Connexus. Good afternoon. I'm Andrea Samuelsen, the CEO of Connexus, a leading Norwegian learning technology company, which has been focusing on the learning potential for every individual. We have delivered learning analytics to 95% of the K-12 schools in Norway, representing 650,000 individuals for more than two decades. New slide, please. In the last two weeks, we have learned a lot about the healthcare industry of Singapore and Asia with the need to focus on a better healthcare and engagement toward community. With a growing aging population, there is also a challenge to serve the community with reduced manpower, to maintain the same level of service standard and at the same time expanding further with more high-tech infrastructure. This calls for efficient use of available resources and building the right human capital for the future needs. Mimir, is a digital learning system from Connexus. It enables an organization, especially organization with complex ecosystems like integrated hospitals to engage their employees, such as nurses in a lifelong learning journey. Mimir provides learning analytics to utilize employees' learning history, experience, certifications, and competencies. Mimir is a platform designed to engage employees and upskill them to prepare your organization for the next growth. Mimir provides you with the knowledge of what your organization can do and a means to build it for the challenge to come. Mimir is currently being deployed in Ministry of Education Singapore for more than 45,000 teachers renowned for high teaching standards and learning outcome. Our solution is also built to IMA security requirements and specification by GoTech of Singapore. This is the end of my presentation. Please feel free to contact me or my colleagues in Singapore. Thank you. Next, we have Vessel Vision. Hello, uh, my name is Katja Talas and I work as a CEO for Vessel Vision Finland. 
I'm going to introduce you a new AI and video analytics based patient fall and accident prevention and management system. Next, please. Oops. Yeah. So mainly the idea of birth vision is to detect automatically risky situations in care rooms and send automatic alarms for help when help is needed. So it's like a 24 seven tireless artificial pair of eyes for nurses or caretakers to secure patients when they cannot always be their presence in their rooms. By the preventive functionalities, versa vision decreases patient falls and accidents by 50%. For those accidents that still do happen, versa vision automatically sends alarms and fast help. Versa vision is developed and tested in close cooperation with Helsinki University Hospital Finland. It is currently on production use in different hospitals, different wards, departments, and elder care units in Finland and abroad. With Versa Vision, there are no wearables. It is uh, unobtrusive, totally contactless, and uh, privacy level can be adapted. By the preventive functionalities, Versa Vision offers very short return on investment time, even just a couple of months. And on Asian market, we are now looking for customers, partners, and distributors. So feel free to contact. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Paul, sir. Yeah. Hi, my name is Evgenia. I'm presenting Pulsar Project Finland. Pulsar provides remote, contactless, and continuous monitoring of vital parameters and behavior of elder uh, people and bedridden people as well. Next slide, please. I want to point out that Pulsar is not a video camera. It's a platform that constantly monitors people's health and activity. It solves the problem of timely providing medical care uh, when uh, significant changes in vital signs, um, cardiac arrests, falls happen. Mm, what, can, what it can do? It can record changes in respiratory rate, in heart rate, without contact in real time to prevent dangerous situations. It can predict critical situations such as seizures, falls, cardiac and respiratory arrests for timely response. We do not analyze the effect of the falls. We can predict falls in 10 or 15 seconds. We can also analyze day and night activities, for example, apnea, insomnia, to make uh, reports about patients hidden diseases with breathing. Additionally, we started tests to determine the early stage of COVID infections due to changes of heart rate and breathing rate for immediate isolation of a person. Pulsar solution consists of two components, high frequency sensors based on micro radar and artificial um, intelligence software for analysis and forecasting. What we are looking for in Singapore? We are looking here for proof of values partners to launch pilots and commercial projects and technology partners to localize the product. What for? To develop life extended solutions together. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, sir. Last but not least, we have Multitech. Thank you. So we see by increasing physical activity, reminiscence and social connectedness, we enrich the lives of all the people and people with dementia. And we do this by focusing on abilities instead of disabilities. I want to use my time now to tell you a story. A woman of 75 living at a care home in Norway experienced a severe hip fracture. Due to her suffering from far progressed dementia, she stood up one day, forgot about her hip fracture, fell over and broke the other hip. Being in strong pains and not understanding the importance of doing the physiotherapy, the care team around her struggled to rehabilitate her. And eventually the doctor gave no hope of rehabilitation. But then she was introduced to most of you. And by watching videos containing familiar places, entire 
childhood memories, joy claim on a specially adapted exercise, got her pains for a while. And with the support of auxiliary engine on the bike, she slowly, little by little, began to heal. And after a while, she regained, regained her strength in her legs and was able to cycle on her own. Eventually, this woman was rehabilitated and regained the ability to walk without the need of any gait aids, even though the doctors initially gave her no hope of that. Next slide, please. We deliver a global video and cycling concept called MotiView with the purpose of increasing life quality for as many older people as possible. MotiView creates intrinsic motivation and enjoyment and helps seniors to be at their natural best. Today, over 16,000 seniors across 800 care facilities in 11 countries are experiencing the health benefits of MotiView. And we also have the first uses in Singapore. And we have great partners supporting in our vision, both from the care organization, branch organization, and governmental bodies, such as the City of London and the National Care Forums and others. We would love to get in contact with more people that want to explore how this can help their seniors and partners and organization that share in our vision, because together we can make a change. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sofer von Notitech. So that brings us to the last company. So if you're interested in these companies and would like to connect with them, please feel free to drop me an email and the list of company names, and we will connect you via email with them. And we will also be sharing their slides uh, at the end of this session by, uh, to you as well. So next, uh, I'd like to introduce the Nordic Chambers in Singapore. So we have Pasi Ha Tai Un for the chairman of Finnish and Business Council Singapore. We have Anders Higer, executive director from Norwegian Business Association Singapore. And of course, we have Lisa Ferriton, general manager from the Swedish Chamber of Commerce Singapore. So Pasi, please. All right, thank you, Jackie. Thank you, the Nordic Innovation House. Um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Pasi Hartainen, uh, uh, the chairman of the Finnish Business Council. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so FPC is founded in 1985. Uh, we are a non-profit, non-political, uh, legal entity for business corporations and individuals based in Singapore um, who are involved in the business between Singapore and Finland, obviously, and doing business out of Singapore, covering especially Southeast Asia. But I dare to say, and more and more uh, uh, business hub to into China as well. And, and if you want to talk about that, uh, please contact us uh, later on. Um, uh, next slide, please. Uh, so what we offer uh, is, is, is the services to our members. So we, we actually have members uh, out of Singapore as well. We have a corporate members, we have individ, uh, individual members. We are kind of main three things we do is knowledge sharing, uh, network and visibility, and obviously then the collaboration with Team Finland or Nordic Innovation House in this case. So what we offer for, for, for all the members and, and whoever wants to come to our webinars and of course, hopefully physical, uh, events uh, starting next year. So that's pretty much what uh, we are for. Uh, we are open for business. Thank you. And yeah, yes, here's the, the, the way you can contact us. Uh, Minna, our uh, general manager, or me. Here's the, the, the uh, email addresses. And here's the, the, all the board members on the link here as well. So after, after that, so please contact us any given time. We can help you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, uh, Anders from Embus. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, hello, uh, dear uh, ambassador designate uh, Ivan Humme and uh, all the participants. It's been really interesting uh, following you. And uh, I don't think yeah, there is any kind of doubt why this topic is uh, extremely important. And I feel when I hear this, that it's such a uh, good example of uh, innovation and care at the same time. So um, short about uh, EMBOS, uh, our mission is support any kind of Norwegian business in uh, Singapore and in the region. And uh, we do that exactly the same way as uh, our Finnish uh, colleagues by creating network arenas, uh, sharing knowledge, sharing experiences, working strongly in uh, Team Norway with the Embassy and Innovation Norway. 
And um, we also seek to strengthen the bonds between Singapore and Norway in uh, any kind of way, cultural, political, uh, and of course, business-wise. So um, in Norway, uh, Norway's presence in Singapore, it has been traditionally within the maritime sector and the energy sector, but we see more and more that we have other groups coming in, uh, educational technology, uh, financial technology, and also health technology. And we have been building up uh, internally uh, a group uh, to make sure that we uh, also uh, make, um, ensure, give visibility to these groups when they come to Singapore and, uh, and want to be visible in the market here and in Southeast Asia. So next slide, please. All right. Oh, sorry. Hold on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> well, it's, um, so what you uh, get as uh, a part of the Endless Network is a guarantee for visibility for your brand. We will promote you at the, our websites and uh, we will write article about you on our uh, website. Uh, it is actually the third most visited website uh, from the chambers in uh, Singapore, only after uh, the German and the French uh, website. So it gives good uh, visibility. We have um, the annual seafood dinner, uh, which you will be then have the right to purchase um, uh, a dinner. It's a great networking uh, opportunity. Uh, and uh, we have some other uh, uh, purchase as well of uh, being a part of our network. So for all coming into Singapore or looking to Singapore as the finish, you don't need to be here in Singapore to be a member or to get access to the network. So just uh, go into our website at uh, nbas.org.sg and, and find out more uh, about us there. We have also, must say uh, our conference, Singapore Norway Innovation Conference, uh, 20th and 21st of October, where we are exploring the business opportunities within the green transition, both within the classical maritime uh, segment, but also uh, within new uh, technology segments as circular economy, smart cities, and also health tech. So warmly welcome there. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Anders. Next, we have from the Swedish Chamber of Commerce, Lisa. Yes, thank you very much. Um, thank you for inviting uh, all the chambers to this Nordic uh, Health Programs closing event. We're very grateful for that. And I think I'm actually the closing voice here, as far as I can see. So uh, my, name is, my name is Lisa Farrington, and I'm the general manager for the Swedish Chamber of Commerce in Singapore. Um, and Singapore has a lot of Swedish multinationals and SMEs established within its borders, and it has had so for many decades, and most of them are members of Swedcham. So we are a nonprofit and membership finance organization as well, and we work very closely with the rest of Team Sweden, which includes also obviously the Embassy of Sweden and Business Sweden. And our association has been around since the 1980s, and although not the biggest, we are one of the most active international chambers on the island, and we also have big collaboration with another 11 sweat champs in the region on the sort of the APAC region. So our only agenda is that of our members and the topics that our members are passionate about include innovation, digitalization, sustainability, gender equality, leadership issues. So these topics permeates most things we do. Last year, we held over 80 events um, due to COVID. Most of them were held online, of course, but we managed actually to have a few safe events face to face. During normal times, we cater for both business and social activities for our business community, but right now it's mainly business, unfortunately, but we hope that Singapore soon will open up also for larger social events because we know our members are looking forward to this. So during the pandemic, we also broke some new ground as we launched our initiative SESG, Sweden Singapore, to support Singapore during COVID. This was a local outreach initiative that placed the spotlight on local entrepreneurship in Singapore and how much small and large companies can learn from each other, especially in times of crisis. And this is an initiative was very well received, both among our members and local stakeholders. So this year we have launched two new local outreach initiatives, 
One on sustainability, where we collaborate with the garden community in Bukit Batok to support the implementation here of uh, Singapore's green plan on grassroots level. And one initiative focusing on uh, broadening the conversation around gender balance in Singapore. So if you take the next slide, I just want to I have not much space. We only had two slides, but these are our main partners, partners and sponsors. And they are really the movers and the shakers within our organization. And with that, I think my two minutes are up. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Lisa. So that's uh, our three Nordic chambers in Singapore. So this kind of like brings us to the closing of this event. Uh, I want to do a shout out to the Nordic Innovation House team in Singapore. So we have the Embassy of Finland, Innovation Norway, Business Sweden, Business Iceland, and of course the Embassy of Denmark, Norwegian Embassy, and of course Embassy of Sweden over here. And if you want to contact us, please feel free. We are always open to new partnerships and collaborations uh, for our programs. And last but not least, of course, check out our website and also follow our social media uh, to receive the latest news about uh, co-innovation, co-creation, and co-development in the Nordics and of course in Singapore and of course our new monthly newsletter to receive updates as well. So once again, thank you so much. My name is Jackie and we will see you again next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. Thank you.